us to use the time well, to come to terms with who we really are, who you really are, and how it is that we are in relationship with one another. We believe that you will find ways to reach us. We ask ourselves, through you, that you might open us so that we can acknowledge and see you. In the name and in the spirit of Jesus, we pray and we say together, Amen. So we're going to begin the season of Lent with a guide called Eric Elms. And Eric is a United Church of Christ pastor who serves a big congregation in, uh, in Omaha, Nebraska. And um, he has written this book. He's also the author of the Phoenix Affirmations, which are sort of the guideline for many progressive churches these days. He's a terrific author. And he has, um, he has actually said that there are gifts of being in places that are of incredible challenge to us. And um, the subtitle is almost as important as the large print, Seven Blessings for Soulful Skeptics and Other Wanderers. I don't know about you, but sometimes I am a skeptic and I almost always am a wanderer. Can I get a witness on that? I hope that I'm, I'm not by myself with that. And um, you might wonder why or where Eric got this um, idea about dark wood. Well, most of you probably aren't experts in 14th century Italian poetry, but you probably have heard of the Divine Comedy, which was written by Dante. And um, it has three main components. And the first co component is inferno or hell. And in that, Dante says, in the middle of the journey of our life, I came to myself within a dark wood where the straight way was lost. Ah, how hard a thing it is to tell what a wild and rough and stubborn wood this was, which in my thought renews the fear. Dante was talking about being driven into this wilderness and being judged because of how sinful he was. And um, Eric Elm says, you know, the dark woods really aren't something evil, not reasons to feel like we're judged by God, but opportunities for awakening, awakenings, revelations. So he's asking us to reclaim the dark wood. Though commonly understood as a place to be feared and avoided, the dark wood is where we meet or encounter God. You may feel uncertain, you may feel empty, you may feel lost, you may feel tempted or alone, but these feelings can be your greatest assets on the journey. They invite you to probe, to question, and discover. You don't have to be above average. This sounds a little bit like Garrison Keeler. You don't have to be above average. You just have to be struggling. Can I get anybody else with me who struggles? So can this be true? Eric said he started reviewing the people that he really admired. And he realized that there was a theme among these folks. These are, these are actually my heroes, not Eric's. But Eric said he started reviewing the people that he admired most, and there was a common theme among them. The common theme was they were well acquainted with pain and struggle. And in fact, the reason they be became as transformational as they did was precisely because they walked in and through the challenges and were transformed by them, as were many other people. So I want to ask you to guess. Um, this is Brian McLaren, whose book we used last year, um, We Make the Way by Walking. And um, I'm guessing some of you probably know who this lovely lady is. Yeah. Anne Lamont, right? Maya Angelou. I, I chose to pick one of Martin Luther King Jr.'s moments of, uh, there are so many pictures of him, you know, kind of docile and quiet. But there was a power in him that made his movement happen. Um, Nelson Mandela was the last person. So I think I would ask you as you begin this journey into the dark wood and looking at the gifts of the dark wood, who are some of your heroes 
for she rose. Take a minute to think about who your heroes and sheroes are. And what qualities or characteristics make them heroes and sheroes for you. And then I would encourage you, as Eric did when he was writing the book, to sort of do a, an inventory of your own timeline, your own history, and think about the, the places that were most important to you. I, and I literally ask you to close your eyes for a minute and just think about your from life, from birth to where you are now. And think about several critical events along that timeline. My hunch is that you came up with some examples that were times of challenge that drew out your most creative part of who you are. Do you have any thoughts like that? Those can be your teachers during the season of Lent. So why does it matter to befriend, befriend the dark wood? Because they're the places where we find God, and because we find God, we find our true selves. We share a deep hunger to be welcomed and affirmed for all of who we are, warts and all. I'm guessing those people who know you best know your strengths and your warts. Can I get a witness on that? <laughs> Thank God they do, because they can hold up a mirror for us. It's probably not the view we have of ourselves. We want to belong, we want to connect, we want to be whole, and we hunger for a place in the world that honors us for who we are. But I stand before you, sisters and brothers, saying there have been lots of times in my life when I've invested energy into creating something that I think people want to see instead of who I really am. Anybody else struggle with that? I can remember one time, especially this was true, I was interviewing for a position uh, in Brunswick, Maine. And it was at the church, First Parish Church, where I kind of felt the sense of call to ministry because it happened to be right across the street from my college. And when the senior position, senior minister position opened up, I knew it would be very competitive because the, the church is about a 900 member church and I had only been an associate minister. I had not served as a senior pastor. And I, I went into this interview and I was convinced that what I had to do was demonstrate to the search committee that I was completely ready to be a senior minister of a church, even though I had goose egg experience. And I found myself going through the interview, kind of patting myself on the back. Wow, I'm doing such a terrific job. This is really going well. I mean, clearly I can tell from the expressions on their faces that I am indeed the one called to this position. I am the exact right candidate. I mean, he didn't agree with me. <laughs> Do you know what it's like to want something so badly and think that you know what's, what, what it is that's right, only to discover it may not be? And does that hurt? And does that not throw into your question, question in your mind about yourself, your own abilities, your own skills? And also, hey, by the way, God, aren't you on my side? <laughs> Sense of 
me and you're so connected with the world in which we live that it's like there's no discrepancy. You're, you're there in the moment. Unfortunately, we know those times, but we don't know exactly how to get to them. So it's like we know what home is, but we don't know exactly how to get there, which is why, boy, that sheep, how did that sheep get there? So the gospel lesson this morning talked about a banquet. And in Jesus' time, it was really important to make sure that you sat in the appropriate place. Now, we might think that's kind of weird, but let's face it. This was a, an ancient tribal kind of um, uh, community in which Jesus lived. And you wouldn't want somebody who's invited that might actually steal your pig or something. Well, it wouldn't have been a pig. <laughs> steal whatever it was that you were eating that was at the heart of the meal. And so Jesus used it as an opportunity to, to teach about humility. But you know, in the context of the dark wood and where we find ourselves, there's, a, there's an even more important lesson for us. Because I, I would encourage you to think about um, the people in your head that sit around your table that have voices. And if you're anything like I am, sometimes the least helpful voice is sitting right beside me. All right? Or across from me. And this teaching from Jesus is saying, make room for the Holy Spirit. Those moments when you hear that you belong to God, Make sure that you leave room for them. Give Holy Spirit a chair, preferably on either side of you. Anybody struggle with those other voices? Look something like that. Or, or why don't you try this? <laughs> so Eric says what he loves, the the the, the the phrase he uses for Holy Spirit is the unexpected love. The unexpected love. And in Hebrew, the word that we translate into English is spirit or breath um, or soul. They all come from that Hebrew word nefesh. Um, and so depending on how you look at it, it could be spirit or it could be breath or it could be soul. Same thing in the New Testament, except the word is duma, Greek. Spirit, breath, or aliveness. And so, in the gospel, when it talks about Jesus after the resurrection, breathing, breathing the Holy Spirit into them, it's that breath. It's the breath of the Holy Spirit. Those are big numbers, right? Between 23 and 26,000. That's how many times you breathe every day. Sometimes we think closeness and constancy will yield awareness. But have you ever noticed that sometimes the things that are so close to you, you don't see them? How many times have you thought about how many times you breathed in the last five minutes? <laughs> We'd all be dead if we weren't breathing, right? But we just do it kind of naturally. Well, spirit is that close to us. So whether bidden or unbidden, Spirit is with us just like our breath, giving us life. So, one of the gifts of the dark wood is to be thinking about the voices that you hear and how you want to make room for Holy Spirit voice or the unexpected love voice. How do you recognize it? Anybody play tennis? I know Alice Leiter used to play tennis. Anybody else play tennis? Come on now. There must be somebody that plays, plays tennis in here. I'm terrible at it. I do whack the ball around once in a while. You know, on the racket, there is a place called the sweet spot. And if you hit the ball enough times, you can find the sweet spot on your racket. And, and you don't even feel the racket when you hit the, with the sweet spot. Right? Well, maybe you're not a tennis player. What about a golfer? Sweet spot. You know what it's like 
I can pop the ball really well, pop it, and then it goes about 100 feet straight in the air and drops about 10 feet in front of me. But boy, if you hit it just right, oh, don't even feel it. Or maybe you've been a baseball player, Louisville Slugger. When I was in Little League, that was the preferred bat. I don't know if it is anymore. But I know playing in Maine where it was cold, if I, if I hit the ball off the tip of the bat, my hands would sting something wicked. Anybody? Softball, baseball, ever. But if you hit the sweet spot, you can't even feel the ball, and yet it will fly forever. Well, not ever, but it'll go a long way. So Eric says, be aware of those sweet spots. Because human beings are a lot like tennis rackets and baseball bats and golf clubs in that we have a sweet spot. Where it's so clear that you belong where you are and that it's okay. Make room for sweet spots. Okay, we all know what this is, right? Beach ball. How many of you have tried to hold a beach ball underwater? It's kind of fun, isn't it? You push it down, and what happens? You push it down, and it goes. The human spirit is like the beach ball, or anything that you try to hold underwater, because the human spirit has a natural buoyancy, and it will try, it will pop, it will try to go towards upward. It will try because of the buoyancy. This is the way the human spirit works as well. At no time are you more aware of your natural buoyancy than when something deep within you feels like you're being prevented from coming up for air. When I heard from the search committee that I did not get the job, I couldn't breathe. Have you ever had a moment when something happened and it felt like your breath was taken away? But you know, if you're patient enough and you pay attention to the saints in your life, that ball's going to pop again. <laughs> Can't hold it down forever. They're like, our, they're like our homing signals so that we can find our true north. I don't know about you, but there have been times when I've wondered if I'm on the right path, going in the right direction. Spirit knows the direction. Okay, first gift, gift of uncertainty. How many people like uncertainty? <laughs> yeah, there are a few brave souls here. Uh, most of us like certainty. We like predictability. We want to know what's going to happen because we like to be in control. We don't want to acknowledge that maybe we can't control everything, but we can deceive ourselves into thinking that we can control everything. How about control freaks in here? Yeah, come on down. Let's get a witness on that. Or, or you know someone who's a control freak, right? So that means everybody in the room. <laughs> now, think about, think about a movie that you love. Now tell me, when you're watching this movie and you love this movie, do you know how it's going to end? Well, maybe not when you saw it the first time. The first time you saw it. No, most of us, if we knew how the thing was going to turn out, if we knew everything, we wouldn't waste 10 minutes watching a movie that was so boring with certainty, would we? It's because there's intrigue and there's mystery, and you're not sure how it's going to end up. How many of you read books for that reason? You don't know how it's going to end up. That's why you read it. And that's what draws us in. Draws us in is story. In mystery, uncertainty is overrated. That's a quote from Brian McLaren. Certainty is overrated. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. I, when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. So that word dimly is actually the Greek word anigmati, which is where we get our word enigma, 
which is where we get our understanding of ambiguity and puzzle and mystery. And Paul, I think, is saying to us, think about a child for a minute. Lots of children like to have certainty. Black and white. What is right? What is wrong? And they're okay with a certain amount of uncertainty, unless it's something like changing the red sippy cup to a blue sippy cup. And watch out. Paul's saying it's a mature faith means you have some comfort with mystery and ambiguity. And it can be your teacher. In fact, the line that I think probably stuck out for me from the first two chapters is that life is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be lived. Does that resonate? And you know what? I am a sucker for problem solving. I told you that last week when I put my toolbox up there, the tools I can't use, but they represent it, the, the way I'd like to fix things. Well, you know my math isn't super, but I do know that 1 through 10 come before 11 and 13, and 11, and 13, 11 through 13 is what we just read, and in case you've forgotten, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 starts with that that scripture, you've probably heard it about 38,000 weddings, about love. Paul could only say, we look dimly and we are okay with mystery if you are coming out of the context of love, so profoundly love that you can be okay with mystery. But I would say that certainty in relationships can suck the life out of them. That might sound, you know, kind of almost weird. As a minister talking about it, what are you talking about? You want us to do this, and then that. this is right, and that's right. You know, the right marriage looks like a perfect, you know, this is exactly how you do it. No, not really. So one of Eric's friends said, I've been married to 29 different women in 30 years. Coincidentally, each of them happens to be named Mariana. Which is to say, he wasn't married to someone with a personality disorder. They had a relationship that allowed for growth and maturity and intimacy and didn't expect that the certainty that they started with would still be there. Now what's certain is that they will stay committed to one another, but if there isn't enough breath in that relationship, it'll suck the life out of it. How many of you have struggled with wishing the person that you were first married to or partnered with, why can't they be just like they were? Man, anybody sense that frustration ever? Greatest way to kill love, take the adventure out of it. Make sense? Kind of scary though, isn't it? We think we want certainty, but we want what we really want is trust. Think about that for a minute. We're seduced by certainty, but what we like is trust. Because if you have trust, then you can be free to be yourself. You don't have to suck yourself in to pretend to fit into whatever it is that either your partner, your family, your friends, your co-workers want you to be or do. You know you're loved. So, certainty can lead to burnout. And Paige did a lovely job introducing the, the conversation um, between David White and his Benedictine spiritual director. Because he said, you know, the antidote for exhaustion isn't rest, it's wholeheartedness. Have you ever found yourself working at something and just sort of taking one step after the other, after the other, after the other, until you don't know why you're stepping anymore? You're just stepping. You're just moving. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving. And before you know it, you don't even know why you're moving. But have you shifted and found yourself working on something and all of a sudden you lose track of time? And even though you may be working hard, you're in the flow. And you've lost any sense that, oh my God, if I have to do this one more time, flawed, flawed, flawed. So there's a swan. The 
Do swans walk on land? Or ducks? Boy, they look goofy, don't they? They kind of can hardly, you know, move. But they lower themselves into their water, and they are transformed. But they have to be willing to step off the certainty of the ground to the water so they can actually find out what their true nature is. I think we're a lot like swans. So uncertainty's greatest gift is that it teaches us to let go of the concerns, just the ones we truly face, giving us the courage and the power to face them. In other words, able to cut through maybe all the layers of what it is that we've created that are challenges and just be able to see what the challenge is. Uncertainty provides the unexpected invitation to live our lives wholeheartedly. There's buoyancy. There's an embracing. Scare the water? Doesn't look like it, does it? Of course, there is a safety ring. And I would call this the love of God. So the gifts this week to focus on are the ways in which the Holy Spirit is with you as a voice that's calling you to trust that you are loved. And there are going to be some sweet spots this week where it feels like your life is hitting the sweet spot. Even if it happens for three seconds or a breath, know that that is God's gift for you. It's true. And it will help you find your way home so that the buoyancy of your life will be available to all. And the people were heard to say, Amen.